I'm Joe Schwartz. I direct McGill's Office for Science and Society. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight in this post-COVID and pre-COVID world, uh, ambivalent world, as, uh, as we know from the uh, number of uh, attendees. We used to have 800 people come to these, and uh, COVID has uh, depleted. But on the other hand, we also have the plus. There are all kinds of people watching us online right now from all over the world. So. Also, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Principal Deep Saini, our new Principal and Vice Chancellor, to uh, welcome you. Uh, principal uh, Saini comes to us from Dalhousie University. Uh, before that, University of Canberra in, in Australia. Before that, University of Toronto, University of Waterloo, all in high positions. Of course, none higher than McGill. You do not get higher than <laughs> principal of, uh, of McGill. Uh, but uh, also very attractive for us in the science community is that he's a plant physiologist. And uh, we've addressed such topics uh, at the symposium often. We've uh, discussed genetic modification on many, many uh, occasions, and we'll probably do so uh, again. Uh, Principal Saini is not a newcomer to Montreal, though. He spent uh, 20 years here at University of Montreal, and uh, he's back home in Quebec right now. So I'd like to ask the principal to greet you on behalf of the university. Merci, uh, Dr. Schwartz, um, et bienvenue uh, et bonsoir à toutes et à tous. C'est un grand plaisir d'être avec, avec vous ici. Welcome to, uh, the, uh, to all of you to the Trottier Public Science Symposium, which is hosted, as uh, you've just heard, by the McGill Office for Science and Society. Um, I had in my notes that this symposium started in 2005, but the man who got it all started corrected me today that it started in 2004. So it's been here um, for a significant one year longer than I thought it, was, it has been. Uh, and it has become a popular fall tradition here at McGill. And thanks to the Trottier Family Foundation, we are able to sustain this event. Uh, thank you very much, Lauren, and, and all members of the Trottier family who are present here. This is a great forum that you have provided us uh, to share scientific knowledge and ideas. The objective of this event is to promote the scientific and the communication scientific and to present the information scientific to a public plus large. It's essentially an exercise of vulgarization of scientific knowledge. Over the years, the Trottier uh, Public Science Symposium has covered a range of uh, subjects. They've always been timely and topical, such as vaccines, life in outer space, the quest for human longevity, and dealing with stress. Many of them I could uh, use some advice on myself, especially dealing with stress. Now, this year's speakers are also very topical. They will examine the ways in which disinformation and misinformation have permeated the world of sports. As athletics are increasingly, as athletes are seek, increasingly seeking out new and often unfounded ways to boost their performance, compete, and win. I would like to thank this evening's speakers, Dr. Elizabeth Mansfield, or Beth Mansfield, and Dr. Nicholas Stiller for being with us and, and, and sharing their knowledge 
uh, with us. We are looking forward to hearing your presentations. Um, I am particularly included. I am, I have been a fitness uh, uh, buff all my life and balanced sports and, and academia all my life. So this, this particular topic means a lot to me personally. Thank you very much for choosing the subject and thank you very much for being here to speak with us. It is now my pleasure to introduce um, the person who introduced me, Dr. Joe Schwartz. And he will share more about our distinguished speakers with you. Uh, he's a popular McGill professor. I think that does not need to be mentioned in this audience. And he's also a public speaker and a figure. Professor Schwartz is the director of uh, McGill University's Office of Science and Society. He's known for his informative and entertaining public lectures on topics ranging from the chemistry of food to connection between the food, the body, and the mind. And I'll tell you one fun fact about him. He teaches a class, the chemistry of food and the chemistry of drugs, which welcomes 2,600 students per semester. This is the largest science class ever in Canada and Canadian history. That's remarkable. <laughs> so without further ado, let me welcome Professor Schwartz to the podium to kick the symposium off. Merci beaucoup, et encore bon symposium. Thank you, Principal Saini. Yeah, separating sense from nonsense. That's the job that we have through my office. And as you can imagine, it's, it's quite challenging. We've been at this quite some time, and the work gets more and more because every day some new nonsense comes out. I just want to share something with you that I wasn't really planning to say. <clears throat> but uh, I, I first got interested really in, in uh, science when I was about 10, here at McGill, when my parents dragged me to a lecture by Hans Seye. Hans Seye is sort of the father of stress. And uh, they dragged me to this lecture, uh, not because I was a precocious youth or anything. It was much simpler than that. He was Hungarian, we were Hungarian. And if a Hungarian guy spoke, you had to go listen. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't understand anything of what he said, except that I knew this was important. And I saw that the audience was really intrigued by this, and I got interested. And I tell you why I'm saying this. Because my grandson here, who's 10 years old, is here for his first ever science lecture in the public. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if we can trigger something. All right, well, through my office, of course, uh, we search for evidence, and we look through the magnifying glass, we scrutinize the world of pseudoscience, we hope to foster critical thinking, and we battle misinformation. Tonight, the stage is set for looking at the world of sports to see whether or not we can separate the sense from nonsense there. There's nothing that is more identified with the world of sports than the Olympics, which have been uh, with us since ancient Greece. And of course, there has been a tremendous evolution in the times, in the techniques, etc. Fascinating thing to look at. Our journey starts here at Olympia in Greece, which is where the first Olympics were held. And here is the original Olympic Stadium, where starting from 776 BC, every four years, the Olympics took place. It was quite different than today. Uh, they performed without any clothes. First Olympians were naked. There was no question in those days, no controversy about the swimsuits or the shoes that could be used. But believe it or not, they were interested in enhancing their performance. They had performance-enhancing substances. They knew about opium, the juice of the poppy. They knew about magic mushrooms. 
They ate the heart of animals, thinking that this would give them strength. And uh, they also dosed themselves with the testicles of bulls. This was the original testosterone therapy, because testosterone is indeed found in bull testes. Other approaches were not quite as scientific. Galen, the famed physician, uh, urged <laughs> some rather questionable substances in terms of performance. But you know that the Greeks did not like anyone who would cheat. And in fact, they were banned. There was doping even back then. And anyone who was caught doping would essentially be banned from any future Olympics, and their name would be etched into the columns, which are still there today. You can take a look. Anyway, in 1894, the Olympics was resuscitated by Pierre de Coubertin. And uh, he introduced the, the motto of faster, higher, stronger, introduced the Olympic flag as well. The five circles, of course, emphasize the five continents, everyone acting together. And the first Olympics were in 1896, the modern Olympics, and in Athens, in that stadium. And it did feature the marathon, which was a race from Marathon to Athens about 26 miles or so. And this was to commemorate an event that occurred way back in, you can see, in 490 BC, when the original marathon runner took the message that the Greeks had won the battle at Marathon. And he ran full speed. This was before the internet. It was before any social media communication. He had to run and transmit this vocally, and he dropped dead at the end. <laughs> well, the marathon was run at the first modern Olympics, and it was won by a Greek by the name of Spiridon Louis. And as you can see, the attire was quite different from what marathon runners wear today. The time was quite different, two hours, 58 minutes, almost three hours to run the marathon. And he was given a silver cup in commemoration of this event. He became a famous person in Greece, much revered. And in fact, in 1936, he was invited to lead the Greek contingent at the Berlin Olympics. He had the dubious pleasure of meeting Adolf Hitler and giving him an olive branch. It didn't work. <laughs> but perhaps the most famous of the early marathons was the one that took place at the 1904 Olympics in St. Louis, which was won by Thomas Hicks, who at the end had to be supported by his trainers. His legs just wouldn't hold him up anymore, and he was carried over the finish line. But during the race, he was boosted with strychnine and with brandy, which was perfectly fine in those days. There were no laws against doping. But if you think that strychnine is of a bygone era, no. Turned out that the 2016 Rio Olympics, an athlete was disqualified for using strychnine. By that time, of course, it could be detected in the blood. Well, the marathon today is still perhaps a premier Olympic event. And the um, world record holder of this event is uh, Kipchoge of Kenya, with the astounding time of 2.01. And any of you who've done any running will appreciate what that is. It is running at roughly 13 miles per hour for two hours. Try to go on a treadmill and get up to 13 miles per hour. I think you will not be able to do it, not for a couple of seconds. He does it for two hours. Not only that, he has also performed a remarkable feat 
running the marathon in under two hours, 159.40, however, this is not recognized as a record. It was not run under normal marathon conditions, uh, although it was run on the street in Vienna, but there was a truck with a laser pointer going in front of him, pointing the best possible route and making sure that he was on time, and he also had some pacers, runners. And he is going to try in the Berlin Marathon next week, legitimate marathon, to see if we can get it under two hours. And if he does, that will make headlines around the world. Well, there is another event that perhaps is even more demanding than the marathon, and that is the Tour de France, the physically the most demanding athletic event. But there's a shadow over that event. Uh, it has been referred to as the Tour de Doping, uh, because it is rife with illegal substances. We first learned about this in 1967 when Tom Simpson, who was a world-class rider, died during the uh, Tour de France, and uh, he was found to have amphetamines in his jersey, and the death was due to that. We're not rid of this. In the Tour de France, athletes are constantly caught for using drugs that are banned, like human growth hormone and uh, EPO, erythropoietin. And of course, the most famous example of using illegal substances is Lance Armstrong, and he has been stripped of his uh, seven medals for the Tour de France victories. You will hear more about this tomorrow, uh, when here at 7 o'clock I will be chatting with Dick Pound the first president of the World Anti-Doping Agency and former McGill uh, Chancellor. And uh, he has had his battles with Lance Armstrong, and we'll certainly hear about that. Lance used erythropoietin, plus many, many other drugs, and he revealed this in an interview with Oprah, so there's no question about this, and you'll hear more of this story tomorrow. Uh, unfortunately, the world of, of sports is filled with uh, people who use drugs to cheat. It's not only in the Olympics, uh, baseball, unfortunately, also. If you remember the classic season when uh, Maguire and Sosa battled for the home run lead, each one hitting over 60 home runs, boosted by uh, steroids. Then, of course, there's a question of, can you do something legal to win, like eat better? What do you eat? to come first in a competition, whether it's cycling, whether it's, it's running. Well, this has been a long controversy. I can tell you when, when I was young, I used to go just about every Saturday night to the forum to watch uh, hockey, standing room. Uh, it was reasonable then, we could afford it. I remember paying $1.75 to stand behind the Reds, it was great. And uh, we would go just before the game to the Texan restaurant that was just across the street. How many of you remember the Texan restaurant? There we go. Well, some of the Canadians would eat there before, before the game. So we'd go up to them, try to get their autographs, and watch what they ate. And it was steak. That's what they ate. That was the pregame meal. And uh, it seemed to have worked. Uh, Canadians did pretty well in those days. This you know, is a remarkable picture because uh, how often did you see Bobby Hall behind his own net? I can tell you that didn't happen often. Uh, but then, uh, of course, the whole carbohydrate loading business came, came around, and uh, the athletes switched to eating carbs before. Uh, in those days, Canadians were always in first place. Now we're close to last. <laughs> Carb versus protein. Then, of course, there's the question of all the dietary supplements that athletes are taking, which we will hear about. And the energy drinks promoted by people like KSI and Logan Paul, huge social media stars. KSI stands for Knowledge, Strength, and Integrity, really. Anyway, I think this is uh, a very appropriate point to bring up our first speaker, who is going to have some knowledge and strength, and he will talk about some integrity. Uh, Dr. Nick Tiller, 
who comes to us from UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, where he is an exercise scientist and, and a researcher, uh, leads a group there. He writes for uh, a number of publications, including Skeptical Enquirer, which is a, a great publication. He does lots of uh, radio interviews, TV interviews, and speaks to the public. Great speaker, as you will find out in a minute. So Nick, uh, if you want to come up and uh, entertain us. Okay, I assume everybody can hear me all right. If you can hear me at the back, can you just give me a wave? Wonderful, okay. So when I was listening, so first of all, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, thank you to the McGill Office for Science and Society. I've watched a number of these symposia over the year. I've always been entertained. I've always learned a lot. So to actually be on the stage presenting to you guys is a real thrill. So it's wonderful to be here. When I was listening to the introduction from Dr. Schwartz just now, I was struck by two things. The first thing I was struck by was how many times I've run a marathon and nearly dropped dead like Pheidippides. And so that rung true with me. And the, the other thing that I thought of was how in ancient Greece, they believed that the blood of gladiators could actually endow people with strength and vitality and all of these good things. They ha at least had the good manners to wait until a gladiator had fallen in battle, and they, they would often rush uh, onto the sand and drink directly from the open wounds. Um, that's true. Now, in some ways, sports science has come a long way. In other ways, it really hasn't. And that is essentially the theme of my talk. Is sport a breeding ground for pseudoscience? This is something about which I'm very passionate. And my aim is, by the end of this talk, to have you nearly as passionate about it as I am. OK, so we're going to start off with some Olympic medals. Well, a picture of some medals. We have gold, silver, bronze. These are from the Tokyo Olympic Games that took place in 2021. It was due to take place in 2020, but didn't for obvious reasons. And I'm going to hit you with a few statistics. So your chances of becoming an Olympic athlete are one in approximately half a million. If you're fortunate enough to have the genetics and the physiology and, and the, the nutrition knowledge and the training knowledge and the opportunities and all these sorts of things, then you've got approximately one in, it's, it's actually closer to 600,000, but I like 500,000, it's a nice round number. Um, so the odds are pretty slim there. If you do go to the Olympics, your chances of meddling are less than 10%. They, they give, I said nearly give out, they don't give out medals, you win a medal. They award about 1,000 medals. And of those, 340 are gold, or at least they were in Tokyo. So your chances of coming away with a gold medal, if you go to the games, less than 3%. Whichever way you slice it, the odds are pretty thin. Now, this is Michael Phelps. He's an American swimmer. And in his illustrious career that spans five Olympic Games, he's won 28 medals. 23 of them are gold. This makes him the most successful athlete, not just the most successful swimmer, but the most successful athlete in history. So you can imagine the splash that he made. You can imagine the splash that he made, <laughs> pun intended, when he turned up at the Olympic Games in Rio 2016 with these large circular bruises all over his back and shoulders. Now, most of you, I'm sure some of you, will recognize that this is the result of cupping. It's an ancient Chinese therapy in which small glass cups are placed on the skin at sites of soreness or injury, and then a suction is created inside the cup with a suction device or even a heated mechanism the premise being is that stimulating energy flow through body meridians can help to unblock these meridians and improve the, the soreness or the injury. Now, if you know anything about human physiology or chemistry, you'll know that these, these mechanisms are not really, they don't relate to what we know about how the body works. And uh, cupping is considered by most 
experts to be a pseudoscience, that is something that looks like science and sounds kind of, kind of like science, but doesn't actually follow any of the protocols or procedures. Actually, in recent years, cupping practitioners have tried to drag cupping, kicking and screaming, into the 21st century by switching out the words energy flow for blood flow. But if you ask me, that doesn't actually do anything to move the conversation forwards. Now, as you can imagine, Phelps's appearance at the game stimulate, simulated a lot of interest. Cupping was covered in the mainstream media. There were news stories written about this. They interviewed doctors and physiotherapists, asking them about cupping. The British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, that you can see on the bottom right-hand side, arguably the largest and most revered, most famous news outlet in the UK actually had a live cupping demonstration on their morning breakfast show. But if you ask me, none of these outlets actually did a decent job of characterizing cupping for what it is, a pseudoscience, it's placebo medicine. They preferred diplomacy to accuracy, and that's a mistake that I vowed never to make. If you look at Wikipedia page views for cupping therapy, we can see how Phelps' appearance at the games influenced the mainstream interest. So page views were trucking along quite nicely at between 1,000 and 2,000 hits per day. And after Phelps showed up at the swimming finals, then there was a spike to well over 100,000 views. So we can see quite clearly how athletes are pioneering population trends in the use of, or at least the interest in, alternative therapies. And I still wonder how many individuals later went on to seek out their own cupping therapists as a result of this. And that's a problem because cupping is not benign. There are many instances in the mainstream media and in the scientific literature of cupping-related burns and infections. I've blurred this image a little bit, it's still quite gruesome, but I've blurred it a little bit just for those of you who might be squeamish. Now, of course, all medical treatments come with risks, right? And under these circumstances, a physician is trained to make a risk-to-benefit assessment, and they will usually make a decision alongside the, the patient as to whether something is worthwhile doing. But when the benefits hinge on placebo, that is, imagined effects, then the risks become much harder to justify. Now, Phelps, of course, is far from the only high-profile athlete that has an interest in pseudoscientific practices. So let's explore some other examples of some high-profile athletes that can give us something to talk about. Now, just a quick public service announcement. The following slides do depict some graphic instances of pseudoscience, so you have been warned. Let's start by talking about the uh, man of the hour, Novak Djokovic. He is uh, widely recognized as one of the most, uh, probably the best and most successful tennis players in history. He, he has a record 23 Grand Slam titles, singles titles to his name, matched only by Serena Williams. There's only one athlete who has more, that's Margaret Court. She has 24, but she retired in the 1970s. Mm. 24, okay. So one of, the, one of the greatest tennis players of all time, and he's also one of the uh, greatest proponents of pseudoscience. So let's just uh, have a look at this. So on the bottom right here, this is a newspaper uh, clipping that uh, talks about when Djokovic was deported from Australia. At the, uh, in January last year, in January 2021, excuse me, um, for violating Australia's border policy on COVID-19 vaccines. They mandated the vaccine. He decided that he didn't want to have it, which is, of course, his prerogative but that is generally considered to be a view that, that contradicts the scientific consensus. Okay, what else have we got? In 2018, Djokovic spoke with an American journalist called um, uh, Graham Bensinger and gave us a little insight into his morning routine, specifically his dietary regimen. Now, Djokovic likes to start the day with lemon water because he says it helps him to detox. We'll come back to that in a moment. He then follows that up with a green smoothie, which is made of fruits and vegetables and algae, again, because it has high levels of antioxidants and it helps him detox. Now, the, uh, the whole idea of a detox is very unscientific because it's based on a misunderstanding of how the body eliminates metabolic waste. 
we have pretty good evolutionarily derived machinery for eliminating waste. It's called the liver and the kidneys. In most people, they seem to work pretty well. We don't need to engage in any of these silly detoxes. It's inherently unscientific. In 2020, Djokovic started making regular visits, pilgrimages, if you like, to the Bosnian town of Visoko to visit the Pyramid of the Sun. Now, this is a pyramid, as you can see, and it is said to have been built by an ancient civilization, and the pyramid is supposedly enshrined with magical healing properties. In this artist's rendition here, you can see at the top of the pyramid, there is supposed to be something akin to an intergalactic Wi-Fi system that allows us to communicate with alien races. Now, I've got a quote here from Djokovic that I'll just quickly read. So when he spoke to reporters, he said, there is truly a miraculous energy here. If there is paradise on Earth, then it's here. But geologists maintain that this is, ju is just a natural flat iron formation. It's due to erosion-resistant rock lying over softer strata. So then the softer rock uh, disappears, and it leaves this pyramid shape. There are these types of pyramids all over the world, including many in the Western United States. And then most recently, in the last year or two, Djokovic has been seen at major competitions with this odd device taped over his chest. You can see here in the top left-hand corner. And this is the towel patch. The Italian manufacturers who make the device claim that it uses, and I'm quoting here, nanotechnology to convert your natural body heat into microscopic beams of light to stimulate the nervous system. So again, if you know anything about how the body works, if you have a passing you know, understanding of physics, you'll know that this is just a science-sounding word salad. It doesn't actually mean anything in the real world. Djokovic has called this device the greatest secret of his career. Scientists call it nonsense. Okay, let's move on from Djokovic. Let's talk about Mr. Tom Brady, arguably the greatest NFL quarterback in history. He, uh, in his best-selling book, he claims that his longevity in the sport, bearing in mind he's retired now for the second or third time in his mid-40s after playing at the highest level, and he attributes his longevity to the idea of muscle pliability. Now, muscle pliability was created by his self-confessed exercise and health guru, a, a chap called Alex Guerrero, who has twice been investigated by the FTC for health fraud, once while impersonating a doctor. But that aside, this muscle pliability concept is just the tip of a pseudoscience iceberg. The rest of it comprises his TB12 supplement brand. Oops. And his TB12 brand endorses everything from uh, uh, immune boosting supplements, supplements to detoxes to alkaline foods, you name it, and, then, and he's interested in it. Let's move on, talk about Cristiano Ronaldo, the last example here. Cristiano Ronaldo is arguably the, well, he's definitely the most famous and revered soccer player of all time, arguably one of the most talented as well, arguably. He recently joined Saudi team Al Nassar for a record $215 million, his basic salary. He makes an extra $50 million a year exclusively through his Instagram account. He is sponsored by large brands, including Coca-Cola, LiveScore, Free Fire, Nike, Herbalife Nutrition, to name a few. He has more followers than Justin Bieber, Kim Kardashian, Taylor Swift, who I'm told is a singer, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He is very, very popular. We can see here, he is obviously brandishing the Herbalife uh, supplements. On the bottom right here, we can see him wearing an abdominal muscle stimulator. This is a device that attaches to the muscle. It bypasses the central nervous system and directly stimulates the muscle into a contraction. It is claimed that it can improve strength and muscle mass and reduce body fat. Now, I did a deep dive on the literature for a recent column I wrote for Skeptical Inquirer, and the literature is very unimpressive. It doesn't do anything that it's claimed to do. Uh, Ronaldo recently launched his own brand of natural spring water called Ursu, U-R-S-U. I assume that's how it's pronounced, which according to the website is naturally alkaline and antioxidant. You can note the uh, 
same old pseudoscience tropes coming up again. And a direct quote from the website, Ursu is synonymous with vitality, energy, life. It is the force of nature. It's hard to argue with that, isn't it? Um, needless to say, those with the most influence, particularly on social media, for example, are not necessarily the ones administering the best advice. Now, this is a topic that I'd like to explore in a little bit more detail, because we have to understand that most young people get the majority of their news and entertainment from social media, and most people get, if they're going to get any advice on diet, exercise, training programs, dietary supplements, recipes, they get it through social media content. So let's think about the types of individuals who are sharing content on social media and the, the reach that they have, the influence that they have. So I tried to come up with four experts who I would trust, from whom I would be happy to take health and exercise advice. Okay? So the first, you might come up with different ones to me. I first thought of somebody like Professor Asker Yukendrup. He's a very well-known professor in nutrition and exercise metabolism. He is based in the UK. I believe he's Dutch, maybe. And he's got, as you can see here, 170,000 followers across Instagram and Twitter. So he's, very, he's, he's definitely an expert. He's well-credentialed. He's doing applied research. And he's got a large social media following. Perfect package. All right, next we've got Dr. Ross Tucker, who has just over 100,000 followers. He hosts, he's co-host of the Science and Sport podcast. I'm not endorsing them necessarily, but it's probably the, uh, the longest running and the most successful, most popular sports, sports science podcast. I thought of uh, uh, Professor Louise Burke. If you know anything about sports nutrition, you'll know who Louise Burke is. Again, a trusted resource, absolutely an expert. Doesn't have many followers on social media, relatively speaking, but that's okay. And then I, I thought of Brad Schoenfeld, again, a professor. He's got 422,000 followers. He specializes in more strength and conditioning, this type of stuff. So these are just four exercise science and nutrition experts from whom I would be happy to take advice. Then we bring in somebody like Tom Brady, who has 17 million followers across Instagram and Twitter. Again, he can leverage his 17 million followers to sell his pseudoscience brand, TB12. Djokovic, 22 and a half million followers. And then Cristiano Ronaldo, forget about it. 710 million followers. Now, of course, exercise science is a relatively young endeavor. It's not been around as long as other disciplines. But even if we replace our exercise science experts with more mainstream science communicators, those who are much more famous and popular, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, Alice Roberts, Richard Dawkins, they still don't come anywhere close to the type of reach and influence of a Cristiano Ronaldo. So when it comes to spreading the message of critical thinking, scientific skepticism, reason, rationality, scientists have brought a knife to a gunfight. Now, something else that I want you to think about is that this isn't just a case of a few high-profile athletes, a few bad eggs in the bunch that are disseminating bad advice. This seems to be a systemic problem. Now, this uh, study was uh, published fairly recently in 2022. It's a review of 20 different studies, sorry, 40 different studies from 14 countries looking at the prevalence of complementary and alternative medicine in the mainstream population. So when we talk about CAM, we mean things like acupuncture, chiropractic, Reiki, energy medicine, non-evidence dietary supplements, things that generally fly in the face of scientific consensus by definition. Right? It's not mainstream. And generally what was found was that most countries that were assessed anyway exhibit a prevalence of CAM somewhere between 24 and 71%. Now the Czech Republic here appeared to be somewhat of an outlier, they're an anomaly, up at an average of 74%, but most other countries sit here roughly between 30 and 50%. Now, I could only find four studies that have looked at this in athletic populations, and what we find is a much higher prevalence of use of complementary and alternative medicine, somewhere between 50 and 80%. It's 50% at the regional level, up to 80% at the international level, why that is, I can only speculate. Maybe the stakes are higher or something. Who knows? But 
certainly it goes without saying that the prevalence of CAM seems to be much higher in athletic populations. And if we put alternative therapies to one side, because it's slow-hanging fruit for scientists like me, and let's just talk for a moment about commercial performance-based products. The only study that has looked at this was published in 2012. It's a pretty good study. We are in need of an update. It was uh, published in the British Medical Journal. And they looked at over 100 different sports performance products and 400 different performance-related claims in relation to those products. And what they found was that in 53% of cases, absolutely no evidence was given to support the claim being made. And when evidence was provided, it was found to be at a high risk of bias in 85% of cases. The authors concluded that there is, quote, a striking lack of evidence to support the vast majority of sport-related products. I've written about this kind of stuff in detail in, a, in some manuscripts that were published over the last few years. I believe they're available open access, so if you want to learn more about this topic, please go and seek them out. So, just an interim summary before we move on. Pseudoscience is at the highest level of sport. And as we've seen, it's not just the high-profile athletes that are interested in pseudoscience. Alternative therapies are pervasive, and the prevalence appears, at least from the data we have, to be more popular in athletic populations. There are baseless claims in the commercial space, baseless claims and pseudoscience, which is a profound problem. But it does beg the question, why are quick fixes so popular in sport? What is it about sport the sporting environment or the sporting culture that seems to push athletes and coaches to want to seek out these quick fixes. Must stay hydrated. So the first thing to consider is this idea of marginal gains. This is the principle that no performance advantage is too small. It was a concept that was created by a chap named uh, David Brailsford, who's the, the former performance director of the British cycling team, who over the last couple of decades have been phenomenally popular. It's the idea that small improvements in various aspects all accumulate, or all cumulative, to have a meaningful impact on the athlete's performance. And You've got to think that the difference between gold and silver is sometimes infinitesimally small. It could be a fraction of a second in a short-distance sprint. And when that's the case, all interventions, regardless of how science-based they are, regardless of how evidence-based they are, they go into this melting pot of possibilities, and it's all justified on the notion that every percentage point counts. It makes athletes and coaches much more experimental than they would otherwise be. The other issue is this uh, idea, that this ethos that is characterized by Ricky Bobby here. I think that reference will be lost on a lot of you. But uh, this idea that if you're not first, you're last. Okay? Now, I've worked in Olympic sports. I've worked with elite athletes and coaches. They generally don't compete just for the fun of taking part. Right? I'm sure they love their sport and they enjoy it, but they're doing this to win. Finishing second or third is not really an option. Not if you have a choice, anyway. And you have to remember that there are reputations and legacies on the line, prize money in lots of cases. And when this is the case, athletes and coaches are desperate to chase down any performance advantage that they can find. This often pushes them to placebo interventions. That is, interventions that work only in the context of expectation and belief. When coaches were surveyed on their use of placebo interventions, this was a survey of 100 different coaches, overall 44% said yes, they regularly use placebos with their athletes. This was down at 30% at the regional level. Again, it went up to 63% at the international level, probably for the reasons that we've already discussed. 15% of those coaches said that they would happily administer another placebo to an athlete, even if it meant deceiving them. Now, again, think about the definition of a placebo. It's only effective if the deception remains intact. As soon as the athlete figures, figures things out, 
then the whole performance advantage is lost. So the whole thing hinges on a deception between the coach and the athlete. And it's hard to... That sounds like it's quite cruel and it's difficult to justify, but actually placebo has very powerful psychobiological effects. We were talking about this in the, uh, in the uh, interval earlier on. This is a, a really nice study which I will uh, just introduce quickly before I show you the graph. This was a study of 43 competitive cyclists. They were brought into a lab and they did a 40-kilometer time trial on a stationary bike. Okay? They did this as fast as they could. On the first occasion, it was just a baseline to get an idea of their overall performance. They then came back to the lab, and they were split into two groups. Half the group got a carbohydrate-based performance-enhancing supplement. The other group were given a placebo that tasted like carbohydrate. So it was a blinded study. They couldn't tell the difference between the two drinks. The groups were further subdivided, it gets a little complicated now, into those who were told that they were given carbohydrate, those who were told that they were given placebo, and those who were told nothing. Okay, stay with me. So when the individuals were not told anything, their performance relative to baseline was basically unchanged. You can see here that zero represents no change in average power output relative to baseline. A decrease in performance would be this side of the line, and an increase in performance would be this side of the line. So not knowing if they were taking a performance-enhancing supplement basically negated the outcome, right? Individuals who were told that they were given placebo, again, no difference relative to performance because it negates the performance effect. Those who were told that they were given carbohydrate generally experienced an improvement in performance somewhere between 1.5% and that looks about 6%, and that is whether or not they had carbohydrate or water. So even having water, when they were told it was carbohydrate, they improved their performance by 5%. So this just is a wonderful example. It's an old study, but I included it because it's a very nice design. It gives us a really keen insight into the very powerful psychobiological effects of placebos. This is why athletes and coaches are chasing these effects so often. But here's the problem, because it's this kind of environment where pseudoscience is so insidious. When we think about the idea that athletes and coaches are chasing marginal gains, the win-at-all-costs mentality, the interest in placebo interventions, it could be argued that athletes and coaches have very unintentionally created the very environment where pseudoscience can thrive. And in that respect, Anybody who competes in sport are just walking, talking prey to the 21st century snake oil salesman. This is a question that I'm asked an awful lot. What's the harm? And it usually goes something like this. Look, Nick, if these athletes and coaches want to use something that doesn't work, then that's up to them, isn't it? Right? Even if there's a placebo effect, maybe there's some kind of psychological advantage. Like, what's the harm? What does it really matter? I'll tell you what the harm is. Well, first and foremost, athletes have limited bandwidth. Okay? There are not unlimited resources in the world. There's limited time. There's limited effort. There's uh, limited uh, money, certainly. Not for the Cristiano Ronaldo's of the world. But for most amateur athletes, they don't have unlimited resources. When I worked at the Olympic Center, most of the athletes who were preparing for the Olympic Games had second jobs. They were training full time. In their spare time, they were waiting tables and working in pubs and bars to earn enough money to live. They certainly don't have unlimited resources. But by spending their limited resources on interventions that seemingly don't work, we could, in a very real way, be inhibiting the true pursuit of sports performance. Note also that most high-profile athletes have at some point endorsed dietary supplements. Here we see Serena Williams, Michael Phelps, LeBron James, uh, Kobe Bryant, Lionel Messi, and Cristiano Ronaldo. These are arguably the celebrity athletes or the athlete celebrities. They are the biggest among their peers. And at some point or other, they have endorsed a dietary supplement. But as we mentioned very briefly earlier on, there are many dietary supplements that are sold over the counter that are either deliberately or inadvertently contaminated with performance-enhancing drugs. This was a landmark study that was published in 2008, but the results of this have been replicated numerous times since. 
They looked at over 600 different nutritional supplements that were purchased in 13 different countries. These are perfectly legal, perfectly safe, over-the-counter supplements, your protein powders, your carbohydrate drinks, your vitamins and minerals. And they found that in 15% of cases, approximately one in seven, they were contaminated with anabolic, anabolic and androgenic steroids, mainly pro-hormones that would likely result in a positive drugs test. So just this widespread endorsement of dietary supplements can cause very real harm. There's some great data here from the Norwegian Anti-Doping Association. And they found that in the last two decades, there have been 192 anti-doping violations. 49 of those, so that's 26% of cases, were blamed by the athlete on contaminated supplements. But here's the kicker. Evidence to support the athlete's claim that it was in fact the dietary supplement was found in less than half cases. So as an example, we can see in 2019, there were 17 anti-doping violations and seven of those cases were blamed on contaminated supplements. Whether it's inadvertent doping by the athlete because they've taken something that's contaminated or whether it's deliberate doping, the outcome is the same. It's a two-year competitive ban. So again, we ask what's the harm? Some alternative therapies are also manifestly dangerous. Very tragically, the mainstream media and the scientific literature are littered with cases where people have tried to use an alternative therapy to treat something that required a real medical intervention. These are just three cases of very many I could have picked. Websites like whatsthaharm.net have documented nearly 400,000 deaths associated with use of alternative therapies. Here I showcase some of the examples from detoxification and also energy medicine. Remember that it's impossible to restrict alternative therapies to the world of sports performance. Sooner or later, if somebody truly believes in the anti-inflammatory properties or the healing properties of some kind of intervention, it's inevitable that they will try and use it to treat something potentially very serious. And then the last example, bear in mind that quick fix interventions that are promoted by high profile athletes or in the commercial world generally don't work. So the blue lines here represent the profits from the weight loss industry. Okay, so this is diets, fad diets and dietary supplements, weight loss supplements. You can see that over the last two decades, profits have been going up and up and up. And we've plotted alongside that the growing rates of obesity. It's a beautiful graph, I think you'll agree. And we've got the rates of obesity have been going up. They've actually been going up since the 1970s. They're now going up exponentially. How can rates of obesity and profits from the weight loss industry both be going up and both be at an all-time high? There's obviously a disconnect between the two things. Whatever we are spending our money on in health and wellness, in weight loss, it clearly isn't working. So a radical paradigm shift is needed. So I've been painting a pretty bleak picture so far, right? I understand that, but there is room for optimism because we do have some solutions. There is an alternative. So as I start to wrap things up, I'm going to try and end on a positive note. Firstly, we have this idea of corrective messaging. Typically, we call it debunking. I don't like the term debunking, so I think it cheapens it a little bit. But corrective messaging, it's not always very successful, but it, it often works. It's, it does sometimes work. And it's more likely to work when we follow the following advice. Be respectful. If you see some kind of misinformation or erroneous advice, be respectful to the other person. Calling them names, calling them stupid, they're just going to shut down. If somebody called you names and called you stupid, you'd probably shut down as well. So that doesn't help anyone. Be respectful. Be detailed, okay? Go into as much detail as you can, given the platform that you're using. Usually, this is going to happen on social media, so there's a limit to that, of course. Provide evidence. Providing evidence is the single thing that distinguishes us from purveyors of pseudoscience. So provide good, robust evidence to support your claims. And lastly, this sort of goes without saying, and it's a little bit sad, but avoid politics and avoid trying to argue with somebody who's, who has very staunch ideological beliefs, whether it's politically based or religiously based, 
The research shows that you're generally wasting your time, okay? This is one of the most harmful things about why the politici politicization of public health policy has become so difficult because what was once quite an easy thing to educate people about has now become politicized. So corrective messaging does work, and if we see somebody advertising snake oil, what we're pretty sure is snake oil, out in the wild, if you feel that you have the credentials, if you feel that you have the evidence, why not confront them about it? We can also lean a little bit more heavily on more nuanced, more sophisticated interventions, not just debunking, but pre-bunking, and something like inoculation theory. This is the idea that somebody can be exposed to a very small, relatively benign piece of misinformation under controlled conditions to prepare their mind, to prepare their critical faculties for a much greater assault further down the line. It works on the same premise as vaccine immunization. And the research has shown this has been very effective. But I think the last and probably the most important thing is that we have to work to get critical thinking education integrated into school, college, and university. At the moment, there is very little to no emphasis on critical thinking in the curriculum. I don't know why this is. I think the curriculum is, is packed. I think students want to learn everything that they need to to pass their exams, to do well in their coursework, and to get a job. And I think the wider discussion about the importance of critical thinking in decision making just really isn't happening. So we need to work to get some of these subjects into, into a university, college, school education, logical fallacies, mitigating bias, not just scientific literacy, but media and social media literacy, so that most of the people that use social media don't understand how the platforms generate content. How can we use these platforms responsibly if we don't know how they work? So that comes under critical thinking. We've mentioned debunking, pre-bunking, inoculation. And then, of course, there's the stuff that we think is quite boring, critical data and statistical analysis, but all of this stuff feeds into decision-making. We can't be responsible members of society if we don't know how to make good decisions for ourselves and for other people around us. That's why I was so honored to be on the ground floor of this new initiative that was started at SICON, Las Vegas, in 2022. This is the Lillenfeld Alliance for the Teaching of Rational Skepticism in Higher Education. It was named after Scott Lillenfeld, who's a professor of psychology, and he was a long time, a lifelong advocate of evidence-based treatments in the field. And so obviously the foundation is named after him. The aim is to connect instructors and professors of critical thinking to communicate and share resources and share ideas. The aim is to get the graduates of tomorrow developing through the system and graduating with these skills ingrained, with critical thinking skills ingrained, so that they have these skills regardless of their chosen major, regardless of their career path. And at SciCon, I put a stake in the sand. I'm going to just uh, sort of reaffirm this idea here that in my discipline of sport and exercise science, I very much intend to lead the charge here in actually teaching critical thinking in exercise science so that we can, we can get these graduates moving forwards with the skills they need to make good decisions for themselves and, again, for each other and for their clients with whom they will work. So just a few take-home messages as I wrap things up. Is sport a breeding ground for pseudoscience? Well, yes, I think it is, but no more so than any other facet of society. I think... Almost every nook and cranny is a potential breeding ground for pseudoscience. Sport is, no, is not the exception. Pseudoscience is harmful and it's unscrupulous, but fortunately there is an alternative. Becoming good critical thinkers, becoming good skeptics, allows us to make better decisions. I will finish, as I always do, with a quote from the late, great James the Amazing Randy. No amount of belief makes something a fact. And I love this quote because... Not only does it cut to the core of what it means to be a good skeptic, a good thinker in 2023, but it's not just relevant to exercise science and sport and health, but to all facets of society. And in my opinion, it's the very first thing that we should be teaching people on their, what we hope will be their lifelong journey into critical thinking. Thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, moving on. Dr. Beth Mansfield, uh, registered dietitian, exercise scientist. She's also an adjunct professor here at McGill in our Department of Human Nutrition. She has worked with all sorts of athletes, counseling them on what exercises to do, what to eat. She's now going to counsel us on what exercise to do and what to eat. Let's welcome Dr. Mansfield. Thank you so much. So I'm actually not going to be counseling you on exercise, but I did want to take a little bit of a different tack um, with my presentation and focus more on taking advantage of the opportunity to hopefully improve your food and nutrition literacy, uh, in particular with respect to physical activity and sport and aging as I'm aging like we all are. We hit 30, it's downhill from there. We want to slow the, uh, the progression of the decline by eating well, being super active. We don't have to be competitive athletes, but certainly physical activity and nutrition, if they could be packaged into a little pill and given to you, they would be the number one prescribed medications in the world for a, a healthy life. So I'm going to talk a little bit about food for thought, how we can tackle our nutrition uh, in terms of the science of nutrition for our health and performance. And we know that optimal performance in sport requires the training to be able to um, compete uh, at the level that we want to, but we need to couple that with proper nutrition. Energy in is energy out. If we don't fuel our bodies to be able to do the physical training and exercise that we want, we're not gonna be able to, to succeed. But what really is proper nutrition and how can we make good nutritional choices when there are, quite frankly, outlandish claims about food, about nutrition, and about eating patterns? And some of those are misinformation that come from friends and colleagues that think they're telling us something that is appropriate but mm, really is a little bit mm, off the wall. And then there's frank disinformation uh, from people who should know better. So the choices that we make in food um, are numerous. Throughout the day, we're making behavioral choices, um, sometimes up to 20 to 30 times a day. So it's a lot of cognitive capacity that we have to harness to be able to fuel our bodies well. So what I hope to do today is introduce you to the challenge of knowing what is actually credible information when it comes to food and nutrition. We'll do a little bit of reviewing of how to power fuel your lifespan for, for health and sport performance by really thinking about how we can put nutrition into action. And then I will summarize with a few final thoughts with some key takeaways. So let's look at sport nutrition. It's a financially lucrative market. There is a regular flood of information about, uh, about nutrition. I did a little Google search using a Google browser um, and I got two and a half million results in my quick little search on what uh, is sport nutrition. Uh, there was sport marketing information, there was food industry information, there was information coming from professionals, there were blogs, there were podcasts, Nick, you were in there, uh, there was social media, Emily, I think you were in there as well, uh, shopping sites, and then there was lots of credible science information um, as well. So lots of information, many, many places to go and get that, that information, and you need to understand that supplements of themselves are over a three and a half billion dollar market alone before we even tackle food in Canada. So this is definitely a lucrative market. So I actually sent out, um, or Emily, actually thank you, from the Office of um, Science and Society, sent out a little survey that some of you took advantage of answering. So I wanted to have a little a priori sense of what were people thinking and doing with respect to nutrition and, and fueling themselves for, um, for their physical performance. So one of the questions I actually asked, and I don't know if any of you um, here uh, filled it in, but we got a couple hundred hits on the survey tool, so thank you very much. 
So I actually asked you, how much do you trust the food and nutrition information from the following sources? So here were the sources that I asked you about. There were uh, the information that you find in newspapers, so you might read Leslie Beck's column in the, the Globe and Mail that comes out uh, most weeks. There was uh, nutrition information on the TV, uh, listening from uh, the radio on food company uh, websites, social media, through physicians, through allied health professionals such as myself and Nick, uh, government info such as Health Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and then our family and friends. And interestingly enough, the uh, ones that seem to be the most trusted for uh, some and a lot um, of the time for you were your physicians, were your allied health professionals like myself and Nick, thank you very much, we appreciate that, um, and governments that are there to work on public health and population health. So when you look at the ones that you actually really didn't trust at all, TV, radio, company websites, and social media were way up there at not being your trusted sources of information. But interestingly enough, you know, family and friends were, you know, you kind of trusted them a little bit and some of them, you know, a little bit more. And that's where often, you know, we can get uh, misinformation uh, traveling through. So we know that the nutrition world is rife with conflicting information, and that's probably why we have some distrust in many of the different types of sources of information. And the nutrition world is rife with conflicting information because it's constantly evolving. What you thought about the cholesterol in an egg and your dyslipidemia 40 years ago is now different in terms of how we might counsel you with your cardiovascular disease risk and how we might talk to you about eggs and your nutrition. Similarly, you know, caffeine used to be promoted as something that was uh, a diuretic. It was, um, made you lose a lot of water. It was a dehydrator and you shouldn't drink it if you wanted to be well hydrated. And now we know that caffeinated beverages like coffee and tea actually do contribute to your fluid balance throughout the day. So the nutrition world is evolving. We're learning more about um, how we deal with different nutrients, about the matrix of food, um, how different components in food work together to actually help us get better health benefits. And that's why some people think, oh, well, that information is conflicting. I used to think it was this, and now you're telling me it's this. It's constantly evolving. Whoops, but let me go back. The problem is, is that that evolving nutrition is not always the credible evidence-based information. If you look on the left here, we've got some information that has proven to be quite helpful, some that is sort of plausible, and we're not really too sure exactly about how things are going to work with that, let's say, nutrient or that uh, food and how it might help us with our performance, but it sort of makes sense. But then we've got a lot of magical thinking that um, seems to be promoted uh, by a lot of, of food industry. And then, frankly, there are things, as Nick had alluded to before, that have proven to be actually quite harmful to us in terms of things that we're in, ingesting. And here's a really good claim that I've seen uh, numerous times and that people really struggle with, and it really sort of exemplifies, well, what is actually happening in how we feed our body? So dietary nitrates make muscles more efficient. They improve sprint performance and reaction time. And dietary nitrates are something that are found in things like beets and beet greens and rhubarb, uh, celery uh, So it's something that had been used for many, many years as a food source uh, to make borscht soup out, to have um, beets that you might um, roast and throw into a salad, to make beet juice. Uh, but then the power of media and small scientific studies trying to pull nutrients out of food and test them to see if, well, can that actual component of nitrite in that beet, if I harness it and put it into a supplement such as this beet shot on the side, is that actually going to be a better way for me to fuel my body so that I can get better performance? Now, arguably, as a food-first nutritionist, I would say, you're probably going to be better off trying to eat it, chew it, and drink it, and make it part of your regular plan. And 
certainly it's not just beets, it's probably a lot of different types of vegetables are also going to give you this advantage. It's not the fact that you, mu you might be spending lots of money on beet shots, you know, before you go and you do your, your training session or your race and feel that that's going to be the be all and um, the end all for your performance. And the Australian Institute of Sport is a really nice agency to go to, to get some really good information, particularly for those of you that are involved in sport and want to get a sense of, well, what are those supplements that have been uh, assessed for, they might have some efficacy for use, uh, some that are still plausible but really we're not too sure of, and what are the ones that are frankly not useful at all. So the Australian Institute of Sport has actually worked on a whole um, section of their information website. If you look over on the bottom right, you can go and get their, um, their resources. Um, so they've been trying to tackle this sort of, how do I feed my body? Do I go with supplements or I, do I look at feeding my body fuel first with food? And they really do the comparison between what is it that the sports nutrition industry is really trying to purvey, trying to express compared to what we as food practitioners and people that are trying to teach you how to fuel your body for sport, what is the difference? And the difference is, is that the triangle of build your base with food, uh, make sure that you have specific timing of different types of foods and fluids to really strategically take advantage of things like pre-fueling, during workout fueling, and refueling post-workout. And then if there's some potentially boosting, you can potentially boost performance by some strategic supplements that might be of some help for you, they would come in only at the end, after you've built your triangle of performance up. Whereas the supplement industry flips it and basically tries to take those everyday fundamentals around nutrition, and those are the last things on the list. They want you to start with supplements and how you can boost performance without really thinking about and promoting. You, need, you really need to, to build a solid base. So what is actually sport nutrition for peak health and performance? Well, one of your trusted sources of information, you said were government sources, and so I've put up here the Office of Nutrition Policy and Promotion of Health Canada, their guide to um, healthy eating, which is using a visual of a plate and talking about how we really need to build our plate with plenty of vegetables and fruits that give us many antioxidants, that give us vitamins and minerals, that give us all those boosting effects you might have found in beets. We need to improve our uh, choices in terms of grains and cereals to make sure we choose whole grains more often. We really make to, need to make sure we do include protein-rich foods, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in, in more detail, but that it's not just animal proteins, that these are plant proteins as well, and that the drink of choice is water. So that's a first place that we think of when we're trying to fuel our body for performance is what's the base plate need to look like in terms of the food choices that we're making on a daily basis. And then we've got some really uh, more tighter uh, focus on our fluid and our nutrient needs on a day-to-day basis? What's the timing of our meals and snacks around the training that we're doing? And what about our food preferences, where we all have different uh, food cultures that we come from, we've been exposed to different things, you know, as we've been growing up, and so we develop, you know, a culture and a palate for certain types of, of foods. That's really important in an athlete's daily nutrition. It's not what I think you should eat, it's what what you have a history of eating, what you like eating, and let's work with that and build from that. And then there's all the issues around um, what we call food literacy and food skills, your capacity to actually plan out meals, buy the appropriate foods to be able to prepare those, um, those meals is really important um, in order to get this daily nutrition, not only for health, but also for performance. And then we've got some really, some strategic performance nutrition things that we really need to look at, which are the adaptations our body makes as we evolve in our training. We really need to do a lot of focus in sport on pre, during, and post-workout nutrition. And then a huge focus on energy and um, availability, in particular around carbohydrates for most sports, not all, but for most sports, carbohydrate is the key limiter of of performance. And this is where there's a lot of misinformation, 
um, and frankly, disinformation around energy and calories. And a calorie is not a calorie. It's not calories that count. It's only fat that counts, or it's only carbohydrate that counts, or carbs don't count, protein does. So the bottom line is that energy counts. And if you can't fuel your body with enough energy, we're going to be running into problems of what we call low energy availability. So we do a lot of work around energy availability in how do I fuel my body for, for exercise and sport performance. And then we've actually moved into some more precision nutrition issues, and that's for dealing with um, issues that someone might have with a gastrointestinal tract. They might uh, be somebody that has celiac disease, has a gluten enteropathy, a gluten intolerance, so we have to find ways to help them eat without uh, having gluten in their diet, um, as just one example. Um, it could be working with athletes that have ostomies, so they have part of their bowel removed, and so we have a very different um, nutrition plan uh, to work with them. We've got allergies and intolerances that we have to deal with, as well as um, athletes and people who are physically active who are also dealing with cardiovascular disease or type 1 diabetes um, or cancer. And it's really interesting that some of our type 1 diabetes who are wearing um, glucose pumps now and have um, continuous glucose monitoring on them, they are so on top of their nutrition that you almost wish all the other high performance athletes that didn't have type 1 diabetes would come and spend a few days with them and really learn they know how to fuel their body because if they don't fuel it right, it's over. Um, they, uh, um, so it's quite serious in terms of, of um, how nutrition plays a key role with someone with type 1 diabetes. And then we also have the nutrition that's really playing a role in body composition. And I would say as a sport dietitian um, and as a nutritionist working in health and wellness, probably the number one request I get, whether it's from an athlete, competitive, recreational, masters, university, or active person, is they all seem to want to lose weight. And it seems to have become uh, something... Um, I would say that's more prevalent post-COVID or that sort of 15-pound to 20-pound COVID weight gain. Um, and I'm also seeing a lot of um, older athletes and physically active men and women who are realizing that now with the change in hormone levels and going through menopause and andropause, they're seeing their power disappear, they're seeing their muscle mass slowly go down, they're starting to talk about maybe they're getting osteopenic, and they're trying to figure out, like, why is this going on? I've been super active all my life, I've been eating really well. What do I need to do in terms of improving my body composition and how can I use nutrition and exercise um, to do that? So these are things that um, we talk about, how we use nutrition um, to work on all of these different aspects of overall health and performance. So a little bit of a nutrition checklist for you, and I'm assuming everybody's physically active, um, so we'll call it a sport nutrition checklist. So the first thing you need to think about is we can go for a long time without eating. We've got days and days and weeks and some of us months of energy stored in us to keep us going, and that's called body fat. Um, but we have a very limited supply of fluid in our body. Men, you know, you're about 60% water. Women, we have a little bit more body fat, less lean body mass per size than men, so we're about 50% water. That's something that is going in and out of us on a regular basis throughout the day. So staying hydrated is actually the first thing that is going to affect our overall health and performance. Now, does it mean that I should be walking around with a water bottle tied to my you know, body and I need to be pounding back fluid, liters of fluid throughout the day? No. And in fact, I see a lot of people over drinking. And when I ask them, you know, why are you drinking so much? You know, they just say, oh, well, I, it's because I pee a lot, so I'm peeing a lot, so I have to, I have to drink. And I'm it's like, well, you know, your body is like, uh, you know, a cup. In fact, if you keep pouring water into a cup, eventually it's going to overflow and it's going to have to let some out. So, in fact, it's not that you're needing to drink because you're losing so much in urine. The fact is your body is urinating because it's saying you're drinking way too much and we've got to get rid of it. We can't handle all of this fluid. So some of us need to do a little bit work on our overhydration skills. Definitely you want to sip when you're thirsty and it's nice to have fluid around um, that you can sip on throughout the day. But staying well hydrated is not about pounding back fluid. Um, and it's also knowing that 
you know, part of that fluid intake is going to come from wet foods. So wet foods are vegetables and fruit and grains and cereals that soak up water when you cook them. It's things like yogurt. Uh, these are all contributing. You eat an apple, you don't know that that apple might be 85% water. You just see an apple. But if you actually took all the water out of it and turned it into apple juice, 15% of what you have left would be the actual what you are eating, all the apple fiber and, and carbohydrate. The rest was actually water. So people don't realize that if you actually fill your plate half full of vegetables and fruit, well, 80 to 90% of those vegetables and fruit on your plate, that's calorie free because it's just water. So when someone says, I also want to manage my weight, I need to stay well hydrated, you know, I want to eat less, I go, hmm, vegetables and fruit. They're a huge calorie-free option as most of their volume is actually coming from water. So you get double bang for your buck. So staying well hydrated is super important. And then we have sort of three phases that we need to think about in fueling our body. So we need to fuel ourselves for the work re required. But we have the energy phase, which is actually how am I fueling myself right before and during that exercise session, I have the recovery phases. What am I doing after that exercise session? Because that's a key time when my, my body is in actually a pretty immunocompromised state. It's in a depleted state, particularly if I've worked out pretty hard. So I need to make sure that I'm refueling appropriately to upregulate um, all the uh, mechanisms such as the immune function, uh, my storage of muscle energy, et cetera. So recovery is super important. And then the build phase is, well, what am I doing in between doing that exercise session, recovering, and then all that rest of the time? That build phase is when you're planning your athlete's plate. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, also on that checklist, I'm staying well hydrated. I'm fueling myself for the work required. I have to also look at the nutrient needs for not only the type of exercise I'm doing, but probably for my age as well. And so we'll focus on nutrition um, in terms of protein nutrition uh, about that so we can give you a little bit of a sense of what that is. Uh, I talked about we need to promote recovery of fluid and fuel stores. That's part of the recovery phase. We also want to make sure that, you know, long term, um, we're able to maintain a body composition, a good bone health and muscle uh, mass. Um, as long as possible. And we want to make sure that we're as healthy as we can be as we age, not only as an athlete, as an exerciser, but also as we go through the, the inevitable decline, uh, which is what lovely aging is all about. Um, but we also want to make sure food is a source of pleasure. And so I was talking about this um, at the little reception before with a, a couple of people about how I used to do a, a show, um, a health segment on, on CTV. And it was on the news at noon at lunchtime. And it was pretty much 90% of the time focused on nutrition. And it got a bit of a cult following so that I couldn't actually go anywhere without people you know, flagging me down and honking from their car if I'd walk along the street. And I'm in Ottawa. This would be in Ottawa. Um, to the point that in grocery stores, people would see me, you know, and they'd run up to me and they'd start to explain why they had certain things in their grocery cart. And, you know, this was not normally, you know, what they normally got and that it was a special occasion. And, you know, and so they, people felt this incredible need to uh, explain their food choices to me. And part of that was, you know, food needs to be a source um, of pleasure. And sometimes some of those foods that are pleasurable foods are not the ones that you're going to be using all the time as your regular plate to fuel your body. So I actually asked um, in the little survey tool that I sent out, I asked a number of questions around what you do now in terms of your nutrition. So one of the things I asked was, in a typical week, how often do you drink fluid? Because I wanted to get a sense of, well, what are you doing in terms of, of your hydration status? It's the first one on your, on your nutrition checklist. So I looked at, I said, you know, what are you doing in terms of before exercise, during exercise, after exercise, and then just throughout your day? So how often do you drink those fluids? So basically, uh, the green was like every time, you know, you're exercising, before exercise, pretty much 50% of 60% of the time, people are topping up before they exercise. Well, we need to improve that. It should be kind of like 100% all the time. Uh, those that rarely or never do it, uh, I kind of, you, you would be on my, my little checklist of we need to talk about pre-workout hydration. Uh, during exercise, 
That's a tough one because it really depends upon how hard the exercise is, how long you're going for, how much you're sweating, is it hot and humid. You can frankly go out for 30 minutes, so some of you run, some of you might walk, etc. Um, you might cycle, and you might not need to actually take fluid in during that exercise session, but as soon as the sweat rate is coming on, it's hot and humid, you can actually feel the sweat on your body, you need to start thinking about you know, always having fluid with you. Um, after exercise, it's great. Pretty much everybody's trying to top up um, with fluids post-exercise. And it looks like, you know, I would say that one, two or three or 10 or 20 people who are the rarely or never drinking fluids throughout the day, you're the ones that maybe you want to start thinking about how you could eat a little bit more wet foods, how you could sip on um, fluids, you know, at break time at work. Um, these could be uh, little things that, that might help you get that fluid in throughout the day. But I would be wondering, all of those who said that they're drinking throughout the day, all the time, just how much? So if you're peeing 10 times a day, mm, you're drinking too much, okay? So then I also asked you, how often do you drink the following beverages? So we looked at, you know, water. So water is the number one recommended beverage of choice. Every government health professional, you name it, will um, endorse that. And it looks like that's pretty much what most people um, are doing. The rarely or never couple of people, um, you know, I'd just be interested in, well, if it's not water, what is it that, you know, you're drinking? Hopefully. You're not the ones who are the daily alcohol drinkers down on the, on the, on the bottom. Um, vitamin waters, um, it was nice to see that these are sort of rarely or never. These are a different type of, of beverage now on the market. I'm going to show you what they are in a, in a second. Uh, but they're really an expensive way to drink water that's flavored, that's also in a plastic bottle that's not sustainable in terms of, you know, environmentally conscious, you know, and it has the presence of of different types of, of vitamins in them that are probably the most unlikeliest ones that you actually need to top up with anyways. They're usually B vitamins. Uh, fruit juice or, or other juice, um, you know, these are beverages that are pretty high in simple sugars. Uh, so we know that they play a role in tooth decay. They also play a role in just drinking down extra calories from, from sugar. They're pretty high in what we call fruit sugar, fructose, which can, um, be problems for people with cardiovascular disease who might have high triglycerides. It actually promotes, you know, even higher triglycerides. So fruit juice is not really something that, you know, we want people to be drinking a lot of. Eat the fruit and get the 85% of the fruit being from water. Get it that way would be better. Um, sport drinks. Uh, so I'm thinking, you know, these things that you see in convenience stores, uh, things like Gatorade and Powerade. Um, so it you know, rarely or never um, pretty much being used um, by most of the people who did the survey tool. Uh, and that's kind of nice to know as well, because again, these are sugar-sweetened beverages that most people don't really need, um, uh, need as part of their uh, regular uh, daily diet. We also have energy drinks. So these are the caffeinated energy, energy drinks. I'm going to talk about that, them in a second as well, um, like Red Bull, et cetera. So, these were first on the market. Um, they're called natural health products. Um, the caffeine content was um, high enough that it gave people who are ca caffeine sensitive a bit of an awakening and made them stay alert. So it was helping keep drowsy drivers alert. Um, I think the problem came in with a lot of the energy drinks is that then you know, they became popular with the youth market and then they started to get mixed with alcohol. And so then you're taking a drowsy, depressed, drunk person who's now throwing Red Bull into the mix that's revving them up again. And, you know, no wonder we had problems with um, Red Bull type shooters mixed with alcohol. Uh, but really these, uh, it was nice to see that these are not a drink that most of you were saying that, that, that we're using at all. I wasn't surprised to see the caffeinated uh, beverages like coffee and tea, so not talking again about the caffeinated energy drinks, but coffee and tea, pretty ubiquitous. Uh, you know, we're users of, of these types of beverages as sort of a pick-me-up. Um, and probably one of the reasons that caffeine got uh, stripped of, of being uh, 
a, uh, on the doping list for athletes. It was so ubiquitous. It was in the food chain. People were drinking it and co having coffee, having tea, eating chocolate, et cetera. It was really hard to um, see if it was really going to be a performance-enhancing effect. And so it's a bit more on a watch list right now for, for athletes. But um, we're also starting to see a lot more decaffeinated coffee and tea um, coming out. And so it was nice to see that. The alcohol, um, in terms of the alcohol-free beer and alcohol-free wine, uh, interestingly enough, they can't seem to keep this on the shelves of the grocery stores. Uh, people are buying it out like, like crazy. Um, and maybe that's, um, you know, coming along with the sort of safety of alcohol, how much alcohol is actually safe to drink. No amount of alcohol is actually safe to drink. It's a noxious substance, but if you are going to drink, there are sort of safe drinking guidelines. Um, so hopefully the, uh, the green and yellow who are drinking alcohol daily or a few times a week, uh, about one in two people, hopefully you're following those safe drinking guidelines. But I just wanted to give you a thumbs up on the water. Um, you know, the, the uh, coffee and tea, they actually contribute to your fluid balance. So again, people say, oh, you know, there's a common misinformation that they are um, fluids that dehydrate you. That would mean that you would actually have to pee off more coffee or tea than you actually took in, which is not true. Um, so they have a diuretic effect. The caffeine makes you lose a little bit more fluid than you would if you had a decaffeinated coffee or tea, but they still contribute to fluid balance. Which is why if you go to the beginning of, I don't know if you see this, Nick, at your ultra endurance races, I'm sure you do, but at the beginning of marathons and half marathon races, you know, what do you see athletes running around with? They're, most of them are, have some type of coffee that they're drinking before the hour or so before they actually do their, they do their race. Um, and then uh, we talked about that. So I just want to highlight the vitamin water and the energy drinks because these are two products that are now a new category of food um, regulated by Health Canada. They're called supplemented foods. And this is where things like sport drinks and caffeinated energy drinks sit. They actually, um, they're prepackaged foods. Uh, they have added supplemental ingredients, so things like vitamins and minerals, so like your vitamin water, uh, amino acids, uh, caffeine, um, and these are ingredients that are not, were not normally found in foods in the high levels that they'd been, um, that we've been seeing them in these different types of, of products. So they actually have a whole new labeling approach. They are called supplemented foods. They don't have a nutrition facts table. They have a supplemented food facts table. And the nice thing about that is it gives you the same basic nutrition information, but it includes the supplemental ingredients. So if you can see over on the right in the supplemented food facts table, it tells you um, in this, for example, energy drink, what are the other ingredients that have been put in that are supposed to have some type of claim around an effect, um, which is the whole reason to put one of these supplemental ingredients into a product. So you can see this one over here, uh, there's uh, a lot of different types of B vitamins. There's vitamin C and E, there's calcium, magnesium, zinc. Um, for any of the pro supplemental um, foods that have ingredients in that there may be some cautions for use, like caffeine as an example, because caffeine is not tolerated well by everyone. It shouldn't be um, used by um, children. There's actually a cautionary label that goes on the front, and you can see over on this, um, this Red Bull Winter Edition, uh, it's got the supplemented um, bar with an exclamation mark and the attribution to Health Canada. That's on the front to show that there's some cautions around the use of this supplemented food. And on the back are the cautionary statements. So that gives you a little bit more information around how that product is um, should be used and what are the risks in terms of the cautions for use. So not recommended for those under 14 years of age or pregnant or breastfeeding women or people who are sensitive to caffeine. There's a guidance around don't drink more than one serving a day for um, all of the others or do not drink on the same day as any other supplemented foods or supplements with the same supplemental ingredients. So for people who might be taking a vitamin and mineral pill or supplementing with 
magnesium as an example, if there's, you know, magnesium as a supplemental ingredient in something else that you're taking, now you can kind of say, okay, well, am I getting, you know, more than enough? Um, so that is very new. It's uh, industry still new products as they come on the market will have to comply with this. Uh, so you'll, you'll start seeing those. I went to the retail food lab, the innovative uh, um, retail food lab here hosted by McGill. I can't remember which building it's in, but it's a, um, um, it's a dépanneur. And uh, in there, they actually do studies to look at how people make food choices. But I did notice, but it's a regular dépanneur. You can go in and buy anything. So I actually saw that winter Red Bull um, with all the new labeling on it, and then all the other Red Bulls still have the old labeling. So what are some guidelines around hydration? The first thing is you really need to listen to your body. You need to make your water and your fluid really work for you throughout your day and during your exercise. So think of, yes, we have a thirst mechanism for a reason. So drink when you're thirsty, drink when you sweat, and you might need to drink a little more when you sweat heavily. So the purpose of hydrating during is not to try and replace everything that you're sweating out. It's to just optimize your hydration status during that workout. So for most of us, if we're doing a one to two hour training session, you know, we're working decently hard, as hard as we can for one to two hours. Pre-workout, I might have um, a couple of, of cups of water with a little bit of tiny little sprinkle of table salt and maybe a teaspoon of maple syrup. That's it. That's all I need to kind of make sure that that fluid is absorbed well. The sodium and the glucose and the maple syrup really, and the sucrose really help us pull that fluid in through our intestine into the uh, plasma. During, um, during that workout, I might have water um, or I might use the same thing that I had pre-workout. And post-workout, I'm just saying, yeah, I wanna make sure that I've got lots of wet foods, water is my fluid of choice, and those foods are likely gonna have salt in them and that's gonna be important to help me pull um, that fluid back into um, my bloodstream and help to rehydrate me. Now, the interesting thing is women typically sweat less than men, which is why we might not need quite as much fluid as our training partner who might be a male. We're also more susceptible to feeling the strain of heat when we're exercising. We actually, for the same level of exercise, we'll have a, a bit of a higher heart rate and we'll have a higher body temperature, so we feel that heat more. Um, we also know that there are sex-based differences based on menstrual cycle. And when women who are still menstruating are in their luteal phase, that increases the temperature even more. Um, and for those of you that might have been going through uh, menopause, where hormone levels are fluctuating um, like crazy, sometimes we might not even feel thirsty when in fact we are a little bit dehydrated. And that's even more pronounced, you know, the older that we get is that thirst mechanism gets dulled. And one of the things that we do see as we work with older and, and older athletes and just the aging population is that fluid is a real risk. So what about that Dutch sport drink, which is that 0% Heineken? Is that something that could replace the social... Uh, beer that somebody might have after their squash match, after their rugby game, after their, uh, you know, ru long run on a, on a Saturday afternoon. Well, those alcohol-free drinks are actually something that can be used. They can rehydrate you. And the difference is, is that alcohol cuts the recovery process completely. It stops your body's ability to be able to recover and refuel and rehydrate well post-exercise. So, you know, when I first got um, um, hired to work with one of the national teams, it was the men's national rugby team. And uh, this was a long time ago. And I'd been a rugby player um, just sort of on the side for fun. And I actually knew a lot of the players um, on, the, on the men's national team. And so the coach says, okay, Beth, here's your, your first job is you need to tell these guys they can't drink. And I'm like, well, fire me now because... <laughs> You know, this is something that, you know, it's there, it's part of the social atmosphere post, you know, workout post game is that they all get together, they celebrate, they drink, etc. cetera. So um, I had to sit down and really think about behaviorally, how can I nudge them in the direction of being able to recover better, become better athletes, not tell them don't drink alcohol, but nudge them in a way that 
they probably wouldn't want to do it as much as they did before. So we actually worked out a contract with them that they had to rehydrate themselves post-workout with fluids, non-alcohol containing fluids, um, to make sure that they'd basically kind of recovered their sweat losses in the match, the, the, the rugby game or the, or the training session. So that was pushing in the window a little bit, but I made them believe in this was a really good scientific approach and that then they also had to refuel with a certain amount of carbohydrate-rich foods following an athlete's plate so that they could get their refueling on top of ready to go. And if once they'd done that and they'd done their massage therapy and their physio, they'd done their hydration, they'd met their refueling needs, then I said, do whatever you want. Do you think any of them had any space or interest in drinking, you know, um, alcohol after that? Mm, it was very infrequent. So sometimes the behavioral intervention, the nudge that you need to do, um, can be a useful way to get people to uh, change their behavior without actually telling them what they're actually going to be doing. So the other thing that I asked you is, during your exercise sessions or sport training sessions, how often do you feel overly tired, cranky or irritable, unmotivated to train or a lack of ability to focus? So it was really nice to see that a lot of you, you know, really, you know, it was rarely or never, but I did notice that in the overly tired, um, there were some of you that it was happening daily, and some of you it was happening three to four workouts and after a pretty, you know, intense week. And that really brings us to this discussion of you need to fuel for the work required. So how often do you actually eat meals and snacks you know, around your training sessions? Because we want an eating schedule, a schedule that optimizes your energy levels. That means throughout the day as well as during your training sessions. So you need to be eating and drinking three to four hours before you get out and train. You might even need to have a snack up to two hours before, maybe even more so if you didn't have a meal three to four hours before. And you might even need a top up, you know, in the 30 minutes before you actually go out um, and do that, that training session, particularly if it's going to be a longer, harder training session. So then I asked you, how many of you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Is it something that you do every day? Is it something you do a few times a week? Or is it kind of rarely... Um, or never. So it's nice to see you're pretty much three meal eaters, but there's a few of you that are skipping out on lunch um, and breakfast or not having it uh, as frequently throughout the week. And then I asked you about your pre-exercise snacking, during exercise snacking, and post-exercise snacking. So pretty much most of you are not really doing a pre-exercise snack. You're not doing a during exercise. So my thinking is, well, maybe you're not doing much physical activity, so you don't feel you need that energy pre and during. But if you're actually showing that you're getting tired, you're getting, um, and especially after you've done three to four training sessions in a week, or it's a pretty, pretty intense week, you need to start thinking about that pre-exercise and during exercise snack. So we really need to be thinking about fueling for the work required is about managing your within day energy availability. And this is where people get into these within-day energy deficits because they don't think about the timing of their food and nutrition. So here's a really good example of what we call a within-day energy balance. So we've got somebody over at um, the left side where I'm starting off the day, I'm going to get up and I'm going to eat breakfast. So I curve up, I eat a couple of, you know, 400 or so calories coming in. And then maybe throughout that morning, I'm sitting at my desk, I take the dog out for a walk. I'm not expending a huge amount of calories, but oh, by the time I get to, you know, mid-morning, maybe lunchtime, oh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to actually do a training session. And then I get into this energy deficit because I'd had breakfast three or four hours ago. I hadn't had a snack to kind of top me up after I came back after maybe walking the dog a little bit, after I'd been sitting at my computer for a few hours, and then I went and I did this tough training session, so I got into this very low energy availability, and then I finished and I said, oh, I better have something to eat. So I take some calories in, I eat something, eat some lunch, but it doesn't really get me up too high in my energy balance. It just kind of gets me back to what I call like a zero line. And then I work in the afternoon, I expend more calories, not very many sitting at my desk, but I'm still burning 60 to 80 to 90, 100 calories an hour sitting there. 
And if I'm using my brain a lot, maybe even more, but then I follow up and I do another training session at the end of the day, and I'm in this big energy deficit at that training session by the time I finish it, and I need to refuel a lot to get me back up to just what I call a neutral. Getting into those large energy deficits during the day can actually lead us to what we call a low energy availability situation. and can actually lead to just feeling like I'm plodding through my training session and I feel like I'm working hard. My heart rate seems to be going up, but like I'm not really getting much um, capacity um, out, of, out of the session. So these energy deficits are not where we want to be. We need to be thinking how I can fuel myself again after breakfast with a snack so I top my energy up again so I'm not falling down into a, a massive um, deficit. And it's also not just a within-day energy deficit I have to think about. Whoops. Um, didn't really show up on here. I can't see it. There should be a white line on there. But basically, it's also a weekly energy availability. And so a number of you had said on your survey that you actually don't you know, have good energy after three to four days of of tough training in a row. So if you start off day one and your muscle energy is topped up, you're 100% ready to go, and you use up that muscle energy but you don't refuel it, day two you're starting with sort of half a tank. Your body will still go because there's gas in the tank, but you get to day three, there's even less. And by the time you get to day four, without proper recovery and building your energy intake back up, you end up feeling like this person, you know, day four. And this is what a lot of university athletes do. They train hard during the week, and they have to compete on Thursday or Friday. And a lot of the coaches will come to me and say, I don't understand. All my athletes are like that when they come into the gym on Thursday or Friday. What's going on? And I go, well, it's pizza. You know, they're just coming home and having some pizza, and then they're getting up in the morning, running to class, not having breakfast, throwing down maybe a, you know, an energy drink or a vitamin water because they think that's going to help them. And they're not really focusing in on getting their, um, their fuel for the work required. So recovery is hugely important. Post-workout, you need, really need to help refuel the tissues. How do you do that? That's where carbohydrate comes in. So there's lots of misinformation around carbohydrate is the worst nutrient in the world. It's making everybody fat. It's causing diabetes. It's giving us all cardiovascular disease. If you're trying to be physically active, and you're trying to perform in sport, carbohydrate is going to be your key friend because that carbohydrate that you take in from foods, and those carbohydrate foods are starchy foods like breads and cereals and things like chickpeas and lentils and kidney beans. They're also simple carbohydrates, so fast-acting, sweet-tasting carbohydrate you find in things like milk and yogurt and fruit. Um, and then these are the ones that actually get packed back into your muscles in the form of muscle glycogen. And they get locked in there with three times the amount of water. So re-fueled uh, muscle cells are not only carbohydrate rich, they're rife with water as well. You need to do that type of refueling probably within the first sort of half an hour post-workout if you're going to be training twice in a day because you need to get a head start on that refueling. Because if you wait too long, that recovery window is open wide for about two hours, and then by four hours post-exercise, it's going to take you a long time, maybe 24 to 36 hours to completely refuel. So for those of us that are training a lot, training once to twice a day, training in the evening, and then we're going to get up in the morning and do another run again, we need to really take advantage of that window of opportunity post-workout. Um, if you're not training the next day, pff, doesn't matter. You got to like four to 14 hours to refuel, because who cares, right? Your next day, you're not doing anything. So it really depends you know, upon um, what you're going to be doing next. The other thing about recovery is in order to get that refueling process going, you actually need to stimulate the muscles to get into pulling the carbohydrate in and to rebuilding the cells that you've basically trashed with the, with the physical activity. So stimulating the rebuilding um, repairing of muscle protein requires an amino acid, which is a build -up building block of proteins, and a key one that it uses is leucine. And it's kind of like a light switch that goes on in your muscles when they sense that leucine is in their environment. It turns the muscles 
um, on, they start the muscle protein resynthesis, then the carbohydrate also gets pulled in, and now you've got this beautiful recovery process going on. So protein is very important in that post-workout window of opportunity. But you don't need a lot. You just need a protein-rich food to help stimulate that muscle protein resynthesis. So is a protein shake uh, something that's going to be important? Not if it doesn't have a lot of carbohydrate in it. So you probably need three times the amount of carbohydrate-rich food compared to protein-rich food to actually also get the refueling um, going. So when is this even more important in terms of optimizing recovery, making sure you get that protein in? It's really important in kids that are growing, so you got to make sure that they're doing that recovery, that protein is in that post-workout meal or snack. People are dealing with injury, um, postmenopausal women, andropausal men, so again, the age-related declines makes our muscles less sensitive to all the growth factors that we need to get turned on, so we actually need to pulse that protein in. People are exercising for, for weight control, tra uh, people training for power, um, for endurance, these are all the different types of athletes that really need to be thinking about making sure that they get protein in with sufficient carbohydrate post-workout. So what are some simple recovery strategies from snack ideas to meal ideas? It's really making sure that you're mixing those protein sources with carbohydrate sources. So it's not about saying, I'm just going to have a whole bunch of eggs. It's about saying, no, I'm going to mix that eggs, you know, with vegetables. I'm going to turn it into an omelet or a frittata, and I'm going to have some toast with it. Or maybe I'm going to turn that egg into French toast, and I'm going to throw some yogurt and berries on top of it, or I'm going to slather it with maple syrup. Um, so it's really thinking about it's not just a protein source. It's the carbohydrate food that you want to add to it. And then you've got that build phase. So you've done your pre and your during workout energy. You've really focused on the recovery. Then you've got to think about the day-to-day, -day, how am I eating to build my body to be able to handle the exercise um, and be as healthy as possible. This is where you start to work with what we call your athlete's plate. So that's really starting to think about carbohydrate-rich foods as your friend and small amounts of protein-rich foods to go along with it. So I actually asked you how often you include carbohydrate-rich foods, and it looks like most of you are choosing things like vegetables and fruit pretty much most days, which is great. Like, we all want to have minimum five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day, which is, you know, a couple of pieces of fruit and maybe some steamed veggies and a salad. Um, so that's super good. We can always do better. Um, there's not a lot of sort of uh, whole grains like whole grain pasta and rice and quinoa. And, and these are fabulous because they soak up water when you cook them. So they're also contributing volume on your plate, particularly when you want to feel full, but you don't want to have a lot of food in. These grains and cereals that soak up water when you cook, cook them are fantastic for that, which is why things like oatmeal um, and rolled oats and, and muesli are fantastic as something that you can have, particularly in the morning, as a way to get going. They're carbohydrate rich. They can soak up a lot of water. You can easily add yogurt to, to oatmeal, to muesli, add fruit to it, and now you've got this fantastic power-packed uh, meal. Um, so definitely we're doing a good job. Um, we could be doing way better with legumes. So legumes are things like lentils, chickpeas, garbanzo beans, kidney beans. These are probably the most fabulous food in the world. They're a plant-based form of protein. They're chock full of complex starchy carbohydrates, full of energy. So they give you lots of energy while giving you protein at the same time. They're also a source of iron and calcium. So they're this powerhouse that we really need to tap into a little bit more. More bean than meat chili, having hummus with vegetables, throwing chickpeas on top of your salad, you know, having a mixed bean salad more often. So these are things that you want to really start thinking about incorporating um, in. And, you know, the people that are saying we need to be low carb are going to be missing the fabulous benefits of things like lentils and chickpeas and, and black beans. So your athlete's plate, really great tool. It was developed um, down at the uh, University of, Col of, of Colorado um, along with the um, U.S. Olympic Committee a number of years ago. And if you 
Um, Alex, I don't know when you went to the Olympics if you saw these up, but they often put them in the food court to show you which kind of food services are, are giving you which type of plate so that you know if you're an athlete that is a lower energy athlete, um, sorry, you're a smaller athlete, you're a gymnast, um, uh, or you're looking at weight management, you really are looking for those meals that are giving you half your plate full of vegetables and fruit. You're watching your grain products because you don't need as much calories as, as some of the other athletes, but those protein-rich foods are still a quarter of your plate. And as we move up to one to two hours of, of competition or training sessions, that plate starts to change a little bit where a greater proportion starts to come from those grains and cereals that give you all that beautiful carbohydrate. We take back from vegetables, but we pull fruit out and add them in as get more carbohydrate from fruit. It's sweet testing, a fast-acting form of energy, and that can be added on as sort of like a dessert type meal. And then finally, when you get into the really endurance training plate, people going for three, five, six plus hours, or double, triple training sessions in a day, now you can see that carbohydrate-rich grains and cereals are really taking over half of that plate. So the emphasis on carbohydrate as the energy demands, the fuel for the work requires more carbohydrate, the proportionality of the plate decreases. So it's a real simple message for all of us as well that we don't need to be eating the hard training plate, which a lot of us do when we go out to an Italian restaurant, as an example, um, you know, when we're walking our dog for 30 minutes a day. So thinking of those plates, you can all go online and you can pick them up. They're a great visual. Um, they can really help you start thinking about how to fuel yourself. But let's really talk about that little protein component of the plate. You can see that little quarter of your plate. Well, what is that actually, um, what are the implications of that? And so some really good work has been done by a prof here at McGill University along with um, another protein researcher at McMaster. So Stuart Phillips and Stephanie Chevalier um, have really been looking at, well, what are the protein requirements? Do, do we actually need more than, than what we think we need, which is the recommended daily allowance? And their sort of summary of the evidence is, is yes, particularly for appetite regulation, for satiety and weight management, we need a little bit more protein at our meals. For the aging population, Definitely, if we want to stimulate muscle protein synthesis and make sure we can help um, retain that lean body mass, our protein needs are higher than the recommended daily amount. And that within day distribution is super important and it looks like we're probably needing to pulse in protein in larger chunks at every meal versus trying to just have it, oh, I just eat a protein rich food, I have some meat, poultry, fish or some plant protein in the evening but the rest of the day I'm just eating toast and bananas and ch crackers and hummus, uh, not really getting enough uh, protein in throughout the rest of the day. So I asked you what types of protein-rich foods you eat most often. 60% of you say you drink milk daily, so that's a really easy way to get a very available, um, uh, fast form of two different types of protein, casein and whey coming in. About more than 40% of you eat um, cheese, fish, eggs, and poultry a few times a week. So lots of variety coming in there. But only about 30% of you eat plant proteins a few times a week. And so that was some sort of a place where I think we could do a lot of improvement. And so again, plant proteins are fabulous. We can actually meet our requirements with a completely plant-based um, diet if we, if we want to, so we don't have to have animal proteins in there. The challenge is just you have to pay a little bit more attention. Um, so what is it about appetite regulation, satiety, and weight management? It looks like the protein needs are about 40% more. So our recommended daily amount is about 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight. That doesn't mean anything to anybody, but just know that 1.6 grams per kilos is actually a complete doubling of the amount. So when we're trying to feel more satisfied, we're eating less calories, and we're trying to manage our, our weight, we actually need to up our protein intake a little bit. Um, and there's a very specific sort of satiety threshold that they've been looking at to see what, how much protein do we actually need to get in at a meal. 
And it looks like it's getting somewhere to approximately about 30 grams of protein coming in at a meal. So you can get it from a protein-rich food. You can also get it some from your grains and cereals, some from your vegetables, some from your beverages like milk or soy milk that you might be drinking. It's not just the key protein-rich um, food. So here are some examples of where you can get protein. If you eat three quarters of a cup of Greek style yogurt, boom, you get about 20 grams of protein right there. And it's very rich in leucine, which is that trigger for muscle protein resynthesis, which is why you see a lot of Greek yogurt and yogurt being used post-workout. It's a really easy way to get that protein in, stimulate muscle protein synthesis, and also help you feel satisfied, and can also help with weight regulation if you're also trying to, uh, again, manage body composition. But if you go down and you look at the animal proteins, the chicken, the pork, the beef, the fish, you can see that in about 100 grams, which is about the size of a small deck of cards, um, you can easily get you know, over 20 up to 30 grams of protein in just one small serving of those, which is why many people fall onto animal proteins as an easy way to kind of bolus in an, a protein-rich food at a meal. But you can definitely do it by mixing and matching legumes with grains and adding vegetables and throwing an egg on top of it um, and having things like uh, quinoa to top it off. We also know that with aging, there's higher protein needs, and that's really there to make sure that we can slow that decline in muscle mass and help reduce the risk of bone fracture in women, in particular uh, women as they get older, particularly as they get over 65 and as they get over 80, super important. And the problem is, is that as we get older, we don't do as much exercise anymore. Um, we also don't eat as much anymore because we're fueling for the work required, which isn't so much. Um, you know, as we get older, um, it's not possible usually for us to train quite as much, you know, as we get into our 60s and 70s because we need more time in between training sessions to recover because our body is not able to get the same, um, it's not as sensitive to the recovery process as it was when we were younger. So we often need one to two days to be able to recover properly from a tough training session, which means we can't be training three, four, five, six, seven times you know, in a week. We might have a tough training session, have a recovery day, another tough training session, a recovery day. Um, so that means that we're often not eating as much as we would be when we were younger, so we're not getting enough protein-rich foods coming in, so it makes it a bit of a challenge for us to think about um, eating enough. So we really want to say, make every bite count, particularly as you're getting older, when it comes to including protein, you know, at at least three meals a day. And because most of us are not eating protein-rich foods at breakfast, we know that from all the dietary studies that we do, people are eating like toast and jam. People are having, you know, cereal with maybe sometimes a little bit of milk, but there's not enough protein coming in there, you know, to really give them enough to stimulate uh, the, the, the bone and the muscle mass that we want to stay there and be healthy. So you want to think about starting with breakfast. Like what can you add in at breakfast that can give you some protein? And that's probably why these here, these supplements have come into the foray, is that they're an easy way for people to bolus in protein, particularly at breakfast. They can mix it into, you know, a shake with vegetables and fruit. They can throw it on top of their yogurt that they can then have with fruit. It's an easy way to not have to plan and think too much. Um, but it can be a useful way for some people to actually get that protein in, particularly as we, as we get older. So how do I get enough protein at each meal? So if I'm choosing one, um, just one source of protein, I need to be thinking, you know, I need quite a large chunk of that protein-rich food. So I need kind of like a deck of cards size of meat, poultry, fish, or I need a big 200-gram block of, of tofu. But, you know, I can mix and match, and I could choose like two different protein-rich sources to kind of fuel my athlete's plate. So I might have half the amount of lean ground beef, which we call mince, and then I might mix it with some chickpeas or some, some lentils or some beans and turn it into a more bean than meat chili. And so by choosing two different protein-rich sources, I actually get the full complement that they want. 
And some of us might prefer to have three different protein-rich sources coming in. I had a little bit of a slice of, of smoked salmon with some feta cheese, and then I had a little bit of, of, of hummus with some veggies. And so that combination of those three things gave me enough protein-rich foods in that meal, along with all the other things I was eating. So here's just some examples of one meal um, with just a portion of mince versus you know, an omelet that's got cheese um, and eggs, and we've got a burrito bowl that's got some meat, it's got some yogurt, and it's got some kidney beans. So going from a one source to a two source to a three source. And all beautiful plates, all fueling me super well for performance. So just some key things to think of, you know, to remember in terms of fueling yourself properly. And we'll just end with this. You really want to be fueling yourself for the work required, which is optimizing your energy intake. So can you actually go out and do the exercise you want to do without undue fatigue? Do you have fast recovery between those training sessions? If you don't, you're missing out on the timing and the amount of food you need um, in that recovery. Are you maintaining your body composition? If you're losing weight, you're not fueling yourself enough for the type of work that's required. If you're gaining body fat, you're overeating. Is the functioning of your body optimal? So women, you really need to think of your menstrual cycle. That's kind of a little bit of a canary in a coal mine for you, a flag. If menstrual cycle starts to change or disappear and you're not premenopausal, you're you know, still a young woman, that's telling you you're probably at risk of a low energy availability. And you really not need to start thinking about how well you're fueling yourself. I mean, it happens to men too. They can get, definitely get low testosterone levels. Um, if they're not feeding themselves properly, so that's a whole other issue um, as well. And there should be really no absence of health and performance issues. If you're fueling yourself properly, you should be able to make the gains that you want with the exercise training that you're doing, um, and you should uh, be able to maintain um, your health as, as you age. So some key things to really think about and take home. And the last resources for you, uh, it was nice that Nick had referred to the same um, Asker Genderup um, over on the right-hand side. He does a lot of uh, infographics on his website, so I put that up for you that you can go and, and check that out. The Coaching Association of Canada has a coach's kitchen, lots of recipes um, for fueling yourself for sport, some journals that are um, great resources for those of you that are intellectually curious and like to read the science, uh, different podcasts. I know I've listened to Nick. I think I've I actually listened to you on here um, with Lauren Bannock. Um, Louise Burke, who is probably the most famous sport dietitian and exercise physiology, her clinical sports nutrition is actually a really interesting book for anybody to read. It's practical as well as being evidence-based. And the Australian Institute of Sport has their refuel a magazine that they publish online, and you can all go and access that. They do a really good job, the sport dietitians, of, of um, putting up the, the latest information and really easy to use resources to help you plan your uh, foods and, and meal prep and fueling yourself for exercise to the best um, of your capacity. So, some resources for you. All right. We'll take a couple of questions. I know we're way, way, way over time, but we'll take a, a couple of questions. <clears throat> Schools and teachers, do you think they're getting enough of this basic stuff as well? So who's 
getting this information? Is it out there? And, and do they not have it, and they're therefore using kind of pseudoscience instead of or in addition to it? Well, I, I think it, it definitely depends on the coach. You know, that you, you're going to get large variability in levels of knowledge and competence and this kind of thing. And, and, and that can be, that, that's a very broad spe spectrum. When I was working in, in the UK, I spent a year solidly working with the UK Flatwater Kayak Squad. And they brought in, they had a few English coaches, but most of their coaching team were Hungarian. And um, they come from a very different sports science system. And so they came over here and they, they're, they're, used to, they're not really used to implementing sports science at all. They, they have a very kind of regimented way of doing things. So I was trying to work with these coaches, and they just weren't, they were inherently suspicious of everything that I was saying. And they didn't really respect me as a professional because they don't really have the same sports science system. So, um, but then the English coaches were much more receptive. I think if you went to the Australian system, you'd probably see something similar. Uh, so I, I think there's large variability. The, the resources are out there, but it, it's down to the individual coach whether, whether they take it up. Yeah, and it's, it's sort of context specific as well. You know, there's some, uh, you know, I've been challenged by working with strength and conditioning coaches that come from um, a, a background of supplementation before food. Um, it, you know, and, and that's a real struggle to try and, when the athletes believe in their strength and conditioning coach and they're being, you know, given information around supplementation and they're not hearing the food first, you but know. School, like schools, schools. Yeah. You mean at high school level? Well, I think, you know, in the Canadian coaching system, they are trying to develop coaches that have baseline, you know, a good understanding of, of you know, long-term athlete development, of which nutrition is one thing that sport dietitians are part of educating the coaches. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's, it's base information. It's the, you know, uh, more sort of food guide type approach. Yeah. Nick, you talked a lot about uh, <clears throat> all the big name athletes and all the, the pseudoscience there. One of the big problems is that kids look up to those athletes and they try to follow in their footsteps. And one thing that we've seen is with this prime drink business, it's gone crazy in schools, right? My Just because. My nephew is yeah. he's 10. Sorry, he's, he's uh, 11 now. He's crazy about this prime stuff. They collect the bottles. I don't know what, it, what it's like here. Um, in the UK, it costs um, eight pounds a, a bottle. So what's that? That's like that's similar to, to dollars. It's probably like 10 Canadian dollars or something like that, maybe a little bit more. A bit more? 12? But, well, really that much? Wow. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a lot of money. And it's just because they've generated this amazing buzz about it. Sorry, I realized I interrupted you. Did you have a... A different question, or you just wanted to? No, no, I just want to up. comment yeah. on that. And, I mean, and, and, and I know that, um, that we, we've sort of touched upon this in that it, there's, there's really nothing in there that, that is, you know, it's just, it, it's just another sports drink. It's got some electrolytes and BCAAs that you probably don't need. You know, maybe if you've done a, a long training session and you're <clears> dehydrated, <throat> and maybe it might be useful to get some electrolytes in, but not $15 worth. Um, but, but the way that they've marketed this thing, and they've, uh, they've used these social media superstars, you know, who, and they're, 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 they've got a, a direct channel to this age group. Um, it's brilliant marketing. You know, you've got to give them that. So. And it's expensive, and it's displacing food. <laughs> you know, like the volume of fluid that, the, that you know, people are imbibing when they're drinking these drinks, it, it cuts their appetite to actually want to eat real food. Um, you know, and the food matrix is what brings you know, a lot to the internal health of our body. It's providing so many different nutrients and probiotics and you name it that you're not going to get from an ultra-processed food. So it's a real challenge. You know, this, this new supplement drink category that Canada now has, they're running a little scam here because you still have the five-hour energy drink, the little bottles, which contain far more caffeine. And that's regulated in a totally different way because mm -hmm. that comes under the natural health product right. branch. So it's not okay for kids to drink a beverage that contains 200 milligrams of caffeine, which is true, it should not be, 
but they can go and guzzle the little five-hour energy drinks to their heart's delight. Well, and I think I was just looking at the new guidelines for the natural health products, you know, uh, directorate. So the labeling now that like they have to have all those cautionary statements. Um, so you know, caffeine would be one of them um, for age and how much, and but you still have to read them. <laughs> okay, one more, yeah. Yeah, really good question. So leucine is one of the, the amino acids that are the building blocks of protein. And pretty much, I don't think there's, I can't think of a protein-rich food that doesn't have leucine in it, okay? So um, it's not that you're, you need to go and take a supplement with leucine. It needs that, means that you just need to choose protein-rich foods. And some are a little bit higher, some a little bit lower. And if you looked at, you know, the one, the little chart I put up, you know, like Greek yogurt, which has the water dripped out of it and the protein concentrated, it actually is a very nice, rich source of leucine. So if you like yogurt, you know, and you have to like Greek yogurt, there's a great, easy way to get it in. But you get it in in all your animal proteins, your plant proteins. Leucine is in all of those. Adam yeah. Labs makes a, uh, uh, I think they were originally meal replacement drinks, but it's in short, and they have it in, uh, in high protein, protein, extra protein drinks. Are they any good? Yeah, so again, these are, your, these are ultra processed foods, right? So they're taking things like um, milk powder or um, concentrates or isolates of protein and mixing them with, uh, could be cane syrup, you know, um, uh, water, uh, vitamin mineral premix. Like there's guidelines um, in terms of the n nutrient quality of what has to be in a meal replacement. So they have to meet all those. Um, but it's not, it's not a food. Right? I mean, it's regulated as a food, but it's not a whole food. It's a very processed um, way to get your calories in. But, you know, these are being used in situations often when people are being challenged to, to eat food and, you know, drink food, and they've, they've often been used in more clinical care situations, right? Um, but we're now seeing them kind of transfer over into uh, sport. And, you know, here's an easy way to top up post-workout. You don't, you don't have to worry about food safety. You just grab it, throw it in your bag, and you know, pop it after. Um, it's more convenient nutrition, I would say. And if maybe I can quickly add to that, so there's a, there's a leucine threshold, and I believe it's, and maybe correct, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something like three grams. Yeah. So you, you need to try and make sure if you're gonna rely on leucine to trigger this increase in muscle protein synthesis, it needs to be about three grams. Now a chicken breast will contain about three, three and a half grams of leucine, and if you're, if you're relying on plant-based sources, it just means that you need to pay more attention to the leucine content if that's something that's important to you. So uh, as Beth said, it's absolutely uh, feasible to meet your protein needs through a vegan or a vegetarian diet. It just requires more planning and more thought that um, a lot of people don't have the, the time or the inclination to do, which is part of the problem. Well, <clears throat> one last quick question there. cold exposure therapy, in terms of sauna therapy, and also in terms of fasting. So I just wanted to hear your opinions on where do these fall in the pseudoscience realm and how, you know, how much of that is actually true science? Do you want to talk about the cold emergency um, recovery? Yeah, so the, I'll talk very briefly about the cold stuff because it's obviously a big subject. We can't get into it in, in too much detail. Massively overhyped. Uh, the the yeah. whole body cryotherapy, for example, which is when you stand in a in like a, a basically a wardrobe from the future that's filled with cold, you know, argon and nitrogen gas. Um, the, the research, it, it may possibly have a very tiny anti-inflammatory effect, but it's certainly not worth the money that's paid. So that, that's really just theatrics. And I've done a deep dive on the literature. I'm, I'm not biased on it. I'm just, this is, the science, is just, it is what it is. And the, the other one, which is very interesting, is cold water immersion, like ice baths. And this has been done since the since the dawn of time, apparently, to, to facilitate recovery. And actually, everything that we know now about um, cold water immersion 
if anything, it inhibits recovery. Yeah. It actually blunts muscle protein synthesis. It blunts anabol anabolic signaling. Some really good papers in like, like Journal of Physiology, which is a very high level journal. And um, actually ice bathing will, will slow recovery down. So, um, so those things are, are very much, I wouldn't say it's pseudoscience, it's more like bad science. So in, in, in that respect, um, yeah, th that stuff is really, really good. Yeah, and so when you see the picture of the athlete, you know, drinking a beer in an ice bath, you just, everything's <laughs> nixed. Like, there's no recovery going. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> we have a couple of souvenirs for you. Uh, so the book that we put together, together with the uh, Goodman Cancer uh, Center here at McGill, and it's a healthy cookbook. Oh, good but for you. But it doubles, as you will see, as weight. Ah, okay. lifting. So you can even use it for exercise. Thank you so much. And also... It's beautiful. We have Nick, a, a souvenir for you. Yeah, keep So my that on. you don't lose too much uh, heat uh, yeah. when you are running. I'll we'll that in a few months. Huh? Thank you so much. And uh, Rath, for you, we have the same thing, just because it looks good. Oh, thank you. And thank you very much for uh, attending. Yeah. And uh, tomorrow, uh, seven o'clock, discussion with uh, Dick Pound. And uh, it will be a very enjoyable one, I can guarantee you that. Yeah. Thanks very much and good night. Good hey, great job.